you know, I just hit puberty and I just like finally matured and filled out. And now I'm going against these guys that are Sam Williams. I don't know if you remember that guy. Mm -hmm. I remember going against him and uh, Logan Mankins Logan, played for the yeah. Patriots. I used to pass rush against Logan Mankins and it was like, holy smokes. You, you didn't get off me? the line of scrimmage, did you? Oh my gosh. <laughs> you did. Hey, a straight stonewalled <laughs> and then the dip that he had, big old dip that he had in his mouth just splattered all over my face every time. <laughs> hey, so, you want to bull rush so, me, you get a face full of dip. <laughs> Tell us what life was like growing up in Fresno, California. So, uh, yeah, so I guess we go go back to the beginning. I, I'll back up a little bit more before that. So I grew up before in Before life in before California? Before life in Fresno. Okay. Uh, so I grew up in a town called Vacaville, California, until I was about 12. Um, Where's my, Vacaville? That Vacaville, like. yeah. So Vacaville is on I-80 in between San Francisco and Sacramento, like right in the middle. Okay. So um, Farm? Armpit? Farm country, yeah. farm land. I thought you were saying arm. Pit. Like, is it the <laughs> armpit? Too, yeah, it's been described that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so yeah, like farm country, like Cowtown is what Vacaville hmm. is kind of known as. Uh, but grew up there. My dad, uh, you know, white collar, worked for Pacific Bell. He started out as a, as a lineman uh, in the Bay Area, climbing telephone poles, uh, kind of worked his way up and then got into sales. And so uh, I guess. Like the first couple of years of my life, he was a lineman and then transitioned over into the sales side. And, um, you know, I was, I would say I was, I was really, really lucky to have the parents that I had. Um, you know, my dad worked his tail off, my mom uh, stayed home with us. Um, but, you know, I, I, my parents were supportive, right? My dad was always there. He was that silent, like, I'm not going to push you to do anything. It's, you know, the only rule I have is if, if you start something, you finish it. Um, but he was at everything, but, wasn't that dad that like made everyone everyone know that he was there, mm -hmm. um, and then you know would never ask questions, never tell me what I was doing wrong. But if I asked, he was there. So really, really lucky to have a father like that. Um, I know you know kind of as I as I grew on in my career, a bunch of my teammates and and friends didn't have that that privilege. So I, I appreciated that from a young age. Um, we then moved to Fresno, which was more blue collar agriculture type of community. Uh, it's where my mom actually grew up and went to high school. And, um, and you know, from a young age, like football was it for me, right? Mm -hmm. That was it. Like there was no other option. Well, how old were you when you made that move to Fresno? I was 12. So okay. going into sixth grade. So when I was going into sixth grade and, and I was, you know, I was uh, from, you know, when I started organized sports at three or four playing soccer, I was always like, okay, I was always decent. Um, but like, I just loved it. Right. Like everything, like it, it, and a story back to, I was four years old at the park across my street in Vacaville, California, uh, three zero seven Alameda court was the house that we, uh, mm. that's not my pin for any of my credit cards. I promise you guys, <laughs> I, guarantee <laughs> it is. I guarantee you it is, <laughs> um, but it, it, I, I was at the park across the street and literally like the kids would all come play football at the park. That was like the park that everyone in the neighborhood came and played at. And I remember four years old saying, okay, I'm going to be Tom Rathman when I grow up. You know, mm. we grew up watching the 49ers. You know, yeah. he was the legendary fullback there in the 80s and early 90s. And, like, he was the man, right? He was tough. He was gritty. And that's who I wanted to be when I grew up, you know, for, from four years old. And so everything that I did was had that in the back of my mind. And I don't know why, like, I had this drive. Like, I wanted to be Tom Rathman. I wanted to be Tom Rathman. I don't know why I didn't want to be Steve Young. Like, yeah, it's like Steve Joe Young Montana or Joe Montana. Or, or Roddy or, Lott. Or, yeah. You know, there's a, there's a whole, whole lot, lot of Roddy it, Craig. Yeah. There's, yeah. yeah. I'm there sitting was, here thinking, I've never heard of this guy. So, oh, man. so you're not a real football you, fan. That's cool, man. That's cool. <laughs> Tom Rathman is a good one now. Go ahead. So, I, and that was kind of my drive. And, you know, as I got older, it was less about Tom Rathman and more about, hey, I, I, I got to play on Sundays. Like, that is what I want to do. That's what I felt like God put on my heart, like, at an early age. And that was what I was going to pursue. The challenge was, and, and this is going to sound really cliche, so I want to be very, like, clear that I recognize that, mm -hmm. that like I didn't have the talent. I wasn't fast. I wasn't strong. I worked harder than everybody, but reality Very was cliche. right. It <laughs> yes. is. And that's what everybody says. Anybody that's in the NFL has the same story, right? Yeah. Like, is it, I, I had something that I had to overcome and, and, but reality was, is like, that was kind of my situation. And I was, I was a guy that was like average at everything, but like I just I just worked really hard and I loved being there and I loved being the first guy in and I love it was 
just, it wasn't something that I felt like I, I had to, I didn't have to work hard to work hard, if that makes right. sense. Right. And so it was just something, but there was also that competitive drive that like, I could never not be the best. And so growing up early ages, I was always kind of middle of the pack. I was kind of awkward. But one thing that helped me at an early age was I established a level of discipline. Um, and that came from wrestling. Mm. Uh, and it came actually from Pop Warner football too. But at eight years old, I had to lose 20 pounds on my own to play Pop Warner football because I was big. I was wow. chunky. So eight years old. At eight years old, I had to lose 20 pounds. And from the, from the time I was eight years old to the time I was 16 – I had to lose a minimum of twenty pounds a year for something. So you had to be playing on the line. Yeah, you your finger, I was. Your I was an O lineman. I was an O lineman. Right. Okay. Except for one game in Pop Warner football, they put me in at fullback, and it was actually at my dad's high school. It was his high school field. They put me in at fullback for one play, and then I scored a touchdown on it. So the next week they put me in at fullback again. I fumbled it, and I went back to the line. line. <laughs> <laughs> what a dumb baby! You guys must have been about twenty when they gave you the ball, uh, huh? and you were on the one yard line. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, for sure, <laughs> for so, sure. Were you losing weight as as part of like a league weight yeah, restriction? Yeah, so, what, so like that? Pop Warner football, like third and fourth grade, I had to be eighty five yeah. pounds, right? And then one hundred five was the next one, um, and then and then I got into wrestling, and then you know with wrestling you've got weight classes, and so you know wrestling is just kind of natural. I got to cut down as much as I can, but for football it was like that's a hard number with my age. I can't go up to the next group because mm-hmm. I have to make that weight. And so early on, like I learned how to just kind of just do the things that I had to do to play the game that I loved. And, uh, and, it, and it carried on, like, again, like I said, as I got older, I mean, I got pictures of me in seventh grade. And I mean, you think Darren's skinny now? Like, you should see, wow. I was all. <laughs> see, that's a shot my way. We're talking about <laughs> yeah, trying to go up. It's a shot. Yeah, over I'm here. I'm just innocent. <laughs> the drive by. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. So, so I mean, I had to cut a ton of weight at an early age, and there, there was just like that, and it was just kind of part of life, and I was used to it, and I, you know, I used to be like, okay, hey, I'm not going to eat for four days, and I'm just going to. So why wrestling? I mean, I know you wanted to be Tom Rathman, you wanted to yeah. play football, but where, where did the wrestling come? I in think on the it? physical aspect of it, and like the competitive aspect of it, um, it was one of those deals. Like, hey, there's a wrestling clinic. Do you want to go? And I was like in third grade, and is this your dad, mom uh, pushing you? I, I don't even remember. I think a friend maybe did huh. it, and like, hey, do you want to go? I was like, yeah, 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 for sure. And I just love the competitive nature of it. And because I, I wasn't drawn to wrestling before that, my uh-huh. dad didn't wrestle. Nobody in my family wrestled, but it was something that I just did. And I and I got in there. I was like, oh, this is fun. Like it's hard, and I'm definitely not the best at it. But like right. I love this. And so so those were the two sports really that I kind of like maintained through you know elementary, junior high, and mm-hmm. high school. And and I moved to Clovis. Uh, outside of Fresno uh, when I was 12 and I went from being like okay like good at stuff like fine but then like I go there and it's like oh wow like this kid's an athlete like this is totally different Mm. like and so then I was like I I came in to be like a quarterback and which I'd never been a quarterback before that your hand fingers are in the dirt yeah Yeah. exactly and so uh, you know things changed when I moved to Clovis where now it was like everything is about sports like this is a sports culture but then like you're thrown into these roles and it's like, now I have to be good yeah. because like I'm that guy on the team. Now I have to be that. Um, but it was, I still had the physical aspect of it that I had to overcome. Um, but uh, you know, just the competitive, the competitive nature, I think that was just in, it, it, it was just, it, it just had, I had to be that. It, it's like, it's your story is eerily similar to so many guys that I've, I've played with or been mm-hmm. around and even at the NFL level, and mm-hmm. they tell stories about, well, you know, he, the, the guy now is in the NFL and he's a star wide receiver and he's yeah. most athletic guy in the building. But then you hear his story and it's like, well, I was off to tackle yeah. in my first five years. <laughs> yeah. you know? And it, it, it just goes to show you how over time how we grow. Yeah. You know, like it's not just your growth, it's the mental growth as well. Yeah. And it's, you know, just in life. Yeah. How things just change dramatically over a five, ten year span. Yeah. And it's true. And I think it's out of necessity too, right? Like and I'll uh, I'm embarrassed to say it, but like even in high school, right? Like my I was my senior year, I was like a five four forty guy. Like Ooh. I was slow, right. like so slow. And, and it was one of those things. And, but I was a running quarterback. I always say like in high school when I, you know, I, I graduated on to be the starting quarterback in my high school and, uh, and, and, 
like I was Tim Tebow before Tebow was Tebow. That was right. the offense that we ran. Uh-huh. Like it was like a run first, like option, and then like out of necessity we'll throw it. Um, but you know, through that it was like again the competitive nature drove me. But then also too like there was a kind of the constant like reminder of like oh like you're good, but like enjoy it like because it's not going to last because you're yeah. not going you're not going to go on beyond that. And and so that was kind of my high school journey, and and I had had I'd had some success, like you know my team uh, won our section title when California that was the furthest you can go. Mm. Um, I was an individual state champ uh, champion in wrestling at two fifteen, um, and Man. and a team and at two fifteen. Two fifteen. And I was I was and, and at two fifteen though it's funny I was as a quarterback I was bigger than my entire offensive line so <laughs> yeah, in high school. <laughs> So I was gonna say you're a giant. Yeah. So so that was like, it, but I was just a bigger guy. But again, it, I started working out at at 13, 14. You know, as soon as it was like healthy or whatever. You know, freshman year you start working out, and but I, I just enjoyed that stuff. Um, but then um, you know I, I go and one of the things was is I was fairly naive in the fact that I thought like okay hey my game tape's going to speak for itself. Mm. Like I was kind of hard headed in that like I'm not going to go to this Nike combine and I'm not going to do all these things. So I was not recruited out of high school. Uh, and, and if it wasn't for the wrestling aspect of it, um, I probably wouldn't have gotten a scholarship to play football uh, because Pat Hill, who's a head coach at Fresno State, my, my entire career there, um, was a big on wrestlers, like the grittiness of a wrestler. Right. And so he was he was big on that. So he used to come to my high school matches like every week. Like, and he was the only one that like paid any attention to me at all. And like, just because I was a quarterback, you know, you get the, uh, the standard, you know, pack 10, all the coaches right. are sending you letters and stuff like that that you get in the weight room in high school. But like, none of it was like anything more than just a standard letter that they sent out. But he showed a lot of attention to me, and it was because of the grittiness. And you know, I wanted to be a quarterback at that time because, like, you know, it was fun being a quarterback right. in high school, and everybody's like, "Oh, that's the quarterback." But uh, so they were like, "Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure, we're going to recruit you as an athlete." So uh, is that where you got? Cra- okay, well, let's go back. Coach Hill was the head coach. The head at the coach. Time? Yep. Okay. Yep. The head coach. Um, and my so yes, so he was the head coach. And uh, recruited me as an athlete. I also played defensive end. So I always played both sides of the ball in high school. We didn't have a big high school team. Uh, So I think we had like 40 or 50 guys on the roster. So it wasn't like a massive team. So I had to play both ways. Um, So I was literally, my senior year, there was four games I played quarterback with a neck roll on. Yeah, it that happened. is awesome. <laughs> it happened. That is fantastic. Meathead City. Meathead City for sure. Seriously, right? dude. So you're the starting quarterback yeah. with a neck roll on, and then when they flip the defense, you're the, the pass rusher. I'm, I'm pass rusher. You know, and again, high school, a lot of like wing T offenses, like a lot of like pulling guards yeah. and cutting and all that stuff. So that was why I did it. Because uh, there was it was back to back weeks that we played like that we called it the butt sniff offense where it's like <laughs> two wings one back and like everybody's like right up right underneath ball. each other. Um, but so so I I did I I wore one um, for those two weeks. You know one was the last game of the season and it was a playoff game too. And I ended up throwing for like 260 yards that game wow. with a neck roll. Like well, believe it or not, man, that's amazing. Dude, yeah. We got to see some film of this. Yeah, I got yeah. This I don't, is phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. That's California football, right? Not not, not near as good as Texas. Is that right? Uh, I don't know, man. No, that's I don't a shot know. Because he's, hey, no, he's a little prideful about that, man. Now. Watch out. I mean, watch out. If we're now. going straight athletes. Well, I mean, so here you go. Don't you know, open up this can. Yeah. Anyway, so, okay. So, anyways, yeah. Can, real, real question, though. Real question. Yeah. Where are your parents in all this? Meaning, yeah. were they athletic? Were they were they encouraging this whole time? Like, mm-hmm. how? Where did your parents fit? In? Like, where did this drive, this this need yeah. for for improvement come from? Um. So I think a couple a couple ways, and, and like without getting too like detailed with like the family dynamic. So I was one of five kids. Yeah. Uh, my dad played high school football, played a little bit in junior college, but like you know, athletics wasn't a huge part of either side of our family. My mom, my mom's dad was a minister. Um, you know, my mom cheered a little bit in junior college, but like there wasn't really like that athletic drive. And so I don't, I don't know. So I was an athlete and so they loved it and they supported it. And so they were there, but it was, it was very much from a, Hey, we're going to let you kind of live your life, do your thing. And if you need us, we're here to support you, which I, I really, I really look back and I'm so thankful for that because I, I watch these other kids who's like, dads are in the wrestling room every day, like just on them all the time. Mm-hmm. And the kids hate the sport. I love sports because like, 
I had the freedom to enjoy it. I right. really did, as opposed to it becoming a job at a That's young awesome. age. So brothers and sisters, where'd you fall in line? So I was second to oldest. So I had an older brother that, that was, you know, he he did marching band and he was not on the athletic side. And then I've got a younger brother who's the middle and he uh, he was a football player, but bigger guy. So he was an offensive lineman. And so he, um, you know, he was kind of like... I don't want to say like in the shadow, but like he he was four years. So he was a freshman when I was a senior. And so he kind of was like, OK, so I saw what he did here in high school. Now I got to follow that same. Path. Right. And then I have another younger brother and sister who were more like arts and stuff like that. My sister is a dancer. Um, but th- dynamic wise, I'll say this is um, there was a level of expectation that I had in high school that like I had to do certain things. Right. Like so I was I was the guy that that had to be perfect. I was the guy that. Um, if I made a mistake, it was, it was, you know, devastating for the family because I was expected to like be the perfect kid. Like I never drank, I never went out. I was always a responsible one. Like in high school, like literally girls in my class couldn't go anywhere unless Tyler was there because I was Mm -hmm. the only responsible one because I had to be, I had to be ASB president. I had to be in leadership because like that was the image that like I had to portray because I felt like it. And I don't know if that was maybe a lack of confidence. I don't know if that was because I just wasn't sure who, what my identity was in. It had to be an athlete and it had to be Mr. Perfect because I, I always looked at everyone else and thought that they were. So I had to work even harder to be in my own image, like that perfect guy. And so I don't know. I mean, it, so high school was fun, but like there wasn't, I mean, there, there wasn't those like relationships that a lot of people have in high school because mm-hmm. everything that I did was sports or school or leadership. And so like, that yeah, was it. So it was back basically football season, yeah, wrestling, wrestling season. season. And did you wrestle your senior year as well? Yeah, I did. All the way through. All so way you held through. on to it yeah, then. That's, I did. That's amazing. Yeah. And then you get recruited. So mm-hmm. what was the decision like going through that process? So I loved, I loved Fresno State, but I also kind of had aspirations to go, to go away. Um, and you, Montana had recruited me to actually play quarterback, but there really wasn't any serious talks. But I, I, when Fresno State offered me, it was in the middle of my season in my senior year. So it was like week three or four um, of my senior year that they actually offered me. And I was like, yeah, I'll go because I don't care where I play. I just want to play ball. Right. Um, so I committed pretty early, kind of kept it a secret through the season and then announced it after after the season that that's that was what I was going to do. Um, but Which it, would be a big thing for anyone from Fresno. Yeah. I mean, they're the Bulldogs. Everybody yeah. knows the Bulldogs in yeah. the city. Yeah. And we had a couple guys that went to high school with us that were playing there. Right. Um, that I mean, yeah, like you're kind of a legend if you're a Fresno State football player right. in, in your hometown. So it was a big deal that I even had the opportunity to go there. But I would say like UCLA was a school that I loved. I loved mm. watching. I, I, it was just a school that I always wanted to go to. And I ended up going on a trip there. Uh, but it was kind of a token, like, hey, you're on our list. Maybe someone fell out. You can come to a game if you right. want to kind of deal. But, like, I was like, oh, man, go to UCLA, be a Bruin. That would be awesome. So it wasn't like I grew up saying Fresno State is I'm, I'm going to be a Bulldog or, right. or nothing else. But it was like, okay, it's an opportunity to keep playing. Don't really care. And I don't care if it's Fresno City College. I don't care if it's you know Southeastern Oklahoma State. It doesn't matter. If I can play ball, I want to keep going because that goal that I had as a four year old to be Tom Rathman right. like still was in the back of my head, and that's just another step. So you get there your freshman year, and uh-huh. I think we all know if you know all three of us played in the, at the collegiate level. What was it like for you your freshman year? Yeah. Ups and downs, the, yeah. the adjustment. What was way the adjustment down, like? Way down. Um, so football was really hard. It was way faster than I was used to. Like people ask, oh, hey, what was the change of change of speed in the game from high school to college versus college to the pros? Like college to pros was not as much for me as high school to college. I mean, you're an eighteen year old kid, now you're playing against twenty two year olds. Right. Like, that's a big difference, right? I just you know, I just hit puberty and I just like finally matured and filled out and now I'm going against these guys that are Sam Williams. I don't know if you remember that guy. Mm -hmm. remember going against him and uh, Logan Mankins played for the Patriots. I used to pass rush against Logan Mankins and it was like Holy smokes! You, you didn't get off me? the line of scrimmage, did you? Oh my gosh! You did. Hey, a straight stonewalled, and then the dip that he had, big old dip that he had in his mouth, just splattered all over my face every time. Hey, so, you want to bull rush me? You get a face full of dip. So, so you went as an athlete, but you yeah. played. Uh, there was no chance. Game? There was no chance I was playing quarterback. Like okay. from the first day, and I actually started as a linebacker, outside linebacker, mm. and played a little bit of middle linebacker. Um, and due to some injuries on the D line, because I was I came in at two twenty. I mean that's a small DN, you know, for the yeah. collegiate level. So I was I was six two two twenty, and um, 
And then because there were some injuries my second year at Fresno State, um, they moved me to D-line. But back to my first year, the transition, like the game was hard for me. Um, I loved every second of it, but life was really hard for me mm. because I'd been at home and I stayed home and I was that perfect guy all the way through high school. I like I went crazy my first year. Like, like I, I just did like, like drinking. P- first partying. time I ever drank. First uh-huh. time I ever went and partied. Like it was totally like totally 180 from Tyler of high school, right? Like I was just that I was out all the time. I had a bunch of different girlfriends. Like my respect level for just life was just very different because I had this uh, this freedom that I never had before. Mm. And so it was it was a hard first year. I skated by because I love the game and I put effort into it was like football and partying. And that right. was it. And I think that's that's similar to a lot of guys. It's not mm-hmm. that's not like unique, but like that was it. But it was just so different from who I was in high school. And so I go through and um, I, I make the change to defensive end my sophomore year. So your freshman Second, year, do you do true friend, Okay, sorry, let's go back shirt, to your yeah. freshman year. Yeah. Do you redshirt your freshman I red shirt, year? I red oh, you shirt. Do. Yep, okay. I do redshirt. Yeah, yeah. So is By there no a, means was I ready to play collegiate mm-hmm. one football. Okay, so point. you go in your freshman year, you redshirt, and then you go through a process of what? Of of understanding exactly what your identity is yeah. or how does that go? Lead us into that. Lead us yeah. into what you did that that after your freshman year. Is yeah. there a conversation you have so, with the coach or Yeah, so I would say I'd compare it to like, you know, a quarterback in the NFL, like the biggest growth is between year one and year two. Right. I think the same is true in college because like, okay, I kind of figure it out. I figure out who's what, but like personally, I'm figuring out what my strengths are. Like, okay, what do I need to focus on? Um, but I mean, I had gone into my second year thinking I was going to be a linebacker, and I was like third on the depth chart at middle linebacker. I was second on the depth chart at outside linebacker, but I'd play a lot, and I'd play a lot of special teams. But in between that year, like I made a very, very concerted effort to say, okay, I'm going to put on 20 pounds, which I, I put on 20 pounds, mm-hmm. and then um, I'm I'm going to be just a better ball player because the first year it was like, okay, I'm gonna I just learned one position, and I understood, okay, hey, I, I know my reads, I know if my guards are pulling I got to do this I know where my gaps are I understand that from this one position going into the second year I said okay I can't pl- I'm, I'm a slow player like I literally at that you time understood I was your, yes your abilities, I, yeah. I had to be I had to be a smarter player to play faster huh. so now it was okay instead of just like trying to like drink you know, water out of a fire hose, it was like, I've got to understand the entire defense, how they work, how the safeties fit, hmm. how outside linebackers fit, what the D line's responsibilities are, how that changes on stunts and, and, and line shifts. And then as a linebacker, what my responsibilities were, how I can make that extra play, but then how I can make that play, extra play without getting outside of my responsibility. So that was, that was year two. And honestly, like, and, and, and I'm really hard, like, I, I really don't like giving compliments, but like, I made a lot of growth as a ball player that year because mm. I had to watch so much. And I and you know coming from being a quarterback in high school and kind of spotlight on you and then nobody cared. Yeah. So it's like okay, I got to earn my way back onto it. So so I go through I go through that that second year and I get thrown to DN in like week with K-State we had a bunch of D-linemen uh, go down. And um, and I remember Darren Sproles was a running back over at K State, and I was like, "Dude, you expect me to tackle this guy? <laughs> right. Like, and these offensive linemen, you know, this is Big Twelve offensive linemen. So these right. are like not whack linemen." But Darren yet, Sproles is like four foot nothing. Yeah, yeah, but you can't, can't see, see him, him yeah. behind those guys. But the difference is, is like whack offensive linemen, like Logan Makins, mm-hmm. for, you know, first round pick to the Patriots, was you know a nine time Pro Bowler, All Pro. I mean, right. a great player. In college, he was a 285 pound tackle, left tackle, mm. 285. Right. Right. Now right. I go Big 12, and it's like this dude is 340 and like all of 6'7. Mm. Like these guys are massive. Right. And so I remember playing in that game, like uh, this DN thing, man, is I can't do it, man. These right. guys are way too strong. Um, but you know what? I was that try hard, white, slow effort guy right. right that was that was who i was the motor continued the motor to go. had yeah. to go right and right. i had to i had to be in the right spots um so making that okay i, I gotta learn linebacker i gotta learn this entire defense now i'm moving down putting my hand on the ground and we ran a fire zone defense so right. defensive end was dropping every once in a while i was a mm-hmm. sam strong side uh, outside the linebacker yeah. yeah or outside defensive end but like also an outside linebacker mm-hmm. at some points so um so 
understanding the entire defense that year and having to sit the year and, and learn all that really helped me because now I could play faster as a defensive end mm -hmm. than I would if I was just like, okay, I'm just going to get off the ball really fast and react. Right. It was like, right. okay, I had I had a concept. And I had a D-line coach that, uh, I mean, I'm going to be honest, I hated him. I absolutely <laughs> hate him. And, hey, Why? Kerry Lachlan, if you ever hear this, I say that out of love <laughs> because – because uh, he was so hard on us. I mean, he uh, was that he was that coach that you'd watch the first step thirty seven over times all, over and over and then again. He's just oh, yeah. he doesn't say anything, yeah. and he just circles the screen with his laser pointer. Yeah. Uh, and that was that guy. And I mean, he had the most one liners out of anybody I've ever ever heard. Like he had an answer to something that would just crack you up or make you want to kill yourself. Right. It was one of the two. <laughs> But uh, anyways, so career goes on at Fresno State. Like I kind of figured out my identity, kind of took on a leadership role going into my sophomore year. So my third season mm -hmm. uh, started and then started the remainder of my career um, and had a really, I mean, I would say successful career. I ended up third in school history in sacks. Uh, I still argue with my buddy who I'm, I'm tied with at third is there was a Hawaii game that they gave him four of my sacks. Cause how, he was wait a minute. How, how do you give four away? Because he was 71, I was 11, he was white, I was white, and we were the same size. And he was like the perennial defense player of the year. So they literally Have you gave ever him, argued about I, these things? I stats? literally, Steve Weekland, if you're listening, I literally went back, showed him the game tape, how clear and concise it was. And they never and he's changed like, oh, it. we already submitted it, you can't change Come it. Come on, man. No, yeah. four yes, sacks. Can. I mean, it would have been it would have been a fourteen sack season for me. Like it would have been like a good like sophomore year. It's like, all right, here we go. But not, no big deal there. <laughs> no, Call no, Steve. No, Make no, it no. right, Steve. No, that's burning in you. Yeah, right? that hurts. That, that hurts. hurts you. That hurts. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I, I go through the co my college career and and had a very successful career and kind of back to when I was in high school, you know the fact that like okay, uh, you know you're not fast enough, you're not big enough, you're not all this, but your game tape is good. And I was naive in the same way mm -hmm. in that like, hey, my game tape is going to speak for itself. Like, okay, I may not be a four sixty in, but like, man, I, I worked my tail off and I got to a four eight. Like right. that should be good enough. And I'm two forty five. And I was effective. Surely I'm going to get an opportunity. Surely yeah. I am. So when is this thought? Pro I know you're in your senior yeah. year now, but go back and tell us when. When was it in your in your career in college that mm -hmm. you started to think, hey, there's another level, mm. and I have an opportunity yeah. to make it to that next level. I would say I would say the idea never went away that that's where I wanted to be. Right, mm -hmm. and and school took a backseat to that. Relationships took a backseat to that. It was football all the way, and I really didn't have a backup plan. But I would say it was my senior year, going into my senior season, where it was like, all right, like I can actually achieve this, and I can actually make it. I had, you know, made a bunch of watch lists and like right. Brocko Nagurski finalists and like all these deals. I'm like, all right, like I can actually like do this. Um, but I just I was very naive in a lot of aspects. And I was like, if I was like, if I work hard, I'll make it. If I keep working hard, I'll mm. make it. If I keep working hard, I'll make it. And so I, that's what I did is I worked my tail off and I kept working. I was the hardest worker and I did all these things and, and all this. I get to draft day, right? And I didn't have any workouts, but I'm like, I'm going to get an opportunity. Like mm -hmm. I would go to pro day. I had a good pro day. I, you know, um, but, I did as well as I could there. As far as scouting, scouts go, were yeah. they giving you the, the inkling that, hey, you know, we like you, we're if yeah. you're there or whatever? Yeah. So, so. Yeah, we're interested, and I also learned to like long snap, and like I, you know, ran some routes as a fullback. <laughs> Doesn't and, that sound like, like Tyler? <laughs> learned everything. Yeah. Well, it's like the whole tool belt. I did. Like. I, I did have. I had. Okay, so I had like the most earth shattering like conversation with with Pat Hill at the time when I was like really upset at the time, but I look back. But the conversation that I had with him after my pro day, after I ran, you know, a forty, and like after I did all this stuff, he's like, "Hey, man." I'm really glad you got your degree. <laughs> wow. Ooh. This is my head okay, coach, right? Coach. And I yeah, had like killed myself. Hey, that's for reality, it. though. But it is. That's reality. It really that's, is. Yeah. And so, and then he's like, you know what? I'm going to be honest with you. Like, you know, uh, there's a chance that someone will give you an opportunity, but here's what I'm going to say. Like, your, your makeup, like, Arena League may be not a bad goal to shoot for, mm. like, if you could play in the Arena League. And I'm like, Dude, come on! I just had four sacks. That got yeah. unaccounted for. Yeah, and that's and that's. I mean, so so I'm like, okay, so so like in high school when people were telling me I wasn't good enough, I wasn't good enough. I'm not going to offer you a scholarship. I'm not going to do that. Now my own head coach, yeah, who I've got a really close relationship with, is telling me like I'm not good enough to play in the league. And so now my mindset is like, man, 
screw the world. I've had to, I've had to work hard. I've had to do all this, mm-hmm. and I'm going to go ahead and prove all them wrong. Well, here's the reality, and and this is fast forward a long time. Like one of the really, really um, enlightening things that I came across was the fact that like so much of it was out of my control. Like getting to Fresno State was out of my control. There was all these relationships that helped me get there. Getting through Fresno State was out of my control because there was some dumb stuff that I did mm-hmm. in college that like I shouldn't have gotten through that because of relationships I did. And then I get here and the relationship that I'm counting on to get me through like isn't there. So I'm gonna take it on to myself. But reality is is like as I get through the rest of my story, it had it had to do with so many people and so many relationships that I had through that process. Mm. But um, I, I go to pro day or uh, the draft day, right? And and, and you've heard did you this go to story. the combine? Did you go? No to the, combine. No nobody. invite. So you didn't get no invited to the combine. Bowl, no you get pro day at the pro day at my school. Okay. Were, at were my you school. doing what a lot of guys do? Did you go travel somewhere and, and train for the pro day? Did you stay? I home? stayed. I stayed home. Did you have an agent at this point? I did, and it, it was my special team coach's wife, which was the only one that would take me. She was the only. I'm agent. not laughing. At no, you are. I'm not, I'm you not are. laughing. At really, she had she not. had a couple guys in the league, but specialists. Like she had kickers. Uh-huh. Um, and so is that not say, a conflict? Is that is there a little bit? A little bit. Yeah, it's a weird deal. <laughs> but but to your point, right? Like having to do everything. It was it was my agent. It was like you're not good enough to play in the NFL at defensive end. You need uh-huh. to be a long snapper. Like that's what you need to do. Right. So I'm like, all right, I'm gonna learn how to long snap. Mm. But I'm still I'm still gonna prove you wrong. I'm gonna prove my head coach wrong. Right. I'm prove everybody else wrong. And so, sure enough, they were right, right? Come draft day, I remember sitting in Clovis, California, um, and you've heard this, Darren, but... Uh, no, everybody needs to hear this, man. All right. So I'm sitting, I'm sitting in Clovis, California, and you know, I knew that, like, okay, God had put this on my heart for when I was four years old that I wanted to play in the NFL. And I'm sitting on my parents' green leather couch. On draft day. On draft day, day one. And I knew, okay, nothing's going to happen day one, but I'm going to watch this whole thing, like... You know who knows who knows what can happen, but like I know that I'm I know that I'm gonna have an opportunity to at least get there and try, right? And then I'll work my way through mm-hmm. it and I'll get there. But I'm sitting there day one and I'll get a call. Day two, it was only three days back then. Um, so day two, um, I go through and I'm like maybe fourth round, like maybe there's a chance, and uh, I'm like maybe I'll get. It. So end of the fourth round, I start seeing all these names go by and I'm like this dude, yeah. I played like, against this dude. I seen, yeah. For real? Yes. Like, this dude yeah. is getting drafted. Like, really? And so, like, and, and it was one of those things, like, if you've ever been around me, like, game day, like, I shut down on Friday afternoon, like, mm-hmm. before a Sunday game. Like, right. don't be around me because I'm just, like, really irritable. A, irritable. Yeah. I just don't be around me. And so I was like that for three days. Like, my parents, like, literally they left the house. They, like, didn't even want to be there because it was like, I, you just can't, I just can't get in a space. And so I remember sitting there and I remember just like looking around the house, the house is empty and day three goes and I'm watching the ticker and like dudes on my team that like weren't even on our team, got kicked off of our team, got drafted Drafted. Yeah, because he had the measurables. He, you know, he was big and he had long arms and he had yeah. all those deals. Right. And so I'm looking at it and I'm just sitting there and I'm like, God, like, why? Like, mm. why would you put this so heavy on my heart? Why would you have me work so hard? Like, why would you have me do all these things and then, like, just take it away from me? Right. So I, I finish it, and then I'm like, okay, well, for surely I'll get a free agent call. I'll get a, a free agent minicamp invite. Mm. Well, I didn't not a single call. Not a single one. And and then I'm just like, I'm sit- and back on that couch, right? And I feel like I spent, like, two weeks on that couch, that green couch. And I'm like... What do, I, what do I do? Like, what's my value? I've been a football player my entire mm-hmm. life. That's what people knew me as. They knew me as Tyler, the athlete, the football player. Like, now what? Like, I didn't take school serious enough to, like, go do anything. Like, what do you want me to do now? Fast forward a week, there's a, a workout for a CFL team, and I go work out, and they offered me a contract to go play up in Canada. Mm-hmm. What was the workout in it Fresno? It was in Fresno, right. yeah, Fresno City College. And it was one of those, you pay $200, there's 400 guys that show up. Right. It's a moneymaker for them, right, as they go on this workout tour. Right. And so um, I ended up getting an offer to play, um, and the only reason was because one of the coaches lived in Fresno and was a coach at Fresno State a few years before I was there. And seen you play. And saw me play. Right. 
And so, uh, so I go up to Canada, and I'm like, you know what? I don't even care. Like, I get to play ball. I'll work my way back down. It's cool. It's kind of been my, my journey the whole way. So I go up to Canada. I play. Wait, I, wait, I wait. Before we go, though, before we go <laughs> here, man, I got we got to slow this down. Because I know man, Ben keeps showing me the clock. He's like, "Man, hurry this thing up." Yeah, well, I, yeah, I just yeah. know that there's some pride in this, like yeah. because I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, you've you've been you've played. You were a starting quarterback, defensive end in high school. You get into college, and then you're a three year starter, and you've been highly successful as far as sacks and breaking mm-hmm. records and whatnot. And then you, the, your pride had to have taken a huge hit through this process. Yeah. I mean, how did you overcome that? Because that's what we're, you know, football players, we're made. Yeah. That's what makes us special is that pride factor of yeah. I'm the baddest dude ever. How did yeah. you overcome? Because you go from not going into the NFL to going to a CFL workout, Yeah, which is probably at the time was probably beneath you to think. I'll tell you, know, you, the guys I was working out against were from like the Fresno Adult Football League, right? Like mm. where they pay. I mean, nothing, nothing wrong with that, but like. To your point, I'm like, what the hell am I doing here? Like, you know, I'm I'm working out against guys that dropped out of Fresno City College, but are tr- still trying to still trying to play ball. Right. And I'm like, what am I what am I doing here? Like, I'm supposed to be playing on Sundays. Like, this isn't mm-hmm. this isn't what like I had envisioned myself. So it was hard, but it was such a hole that it was a really easy decision for me to play ball. Because again, the passion for the game never went away. Now there was maybe a false sense of ego. There was there was all of that that maybe was was in place. But like I loved ball. I loved everything to do with it. I loved studying it. I loved playing it. I loved practicing. Like I was that weird dude that actually liked practice. Like literally in my entire career, I've never missed a practice. Like high school, college, Uh, pros, never missed a practice. You still are a weird dude. But go on. So you go to. CFL. Yeah, so I play up there, um, and and you know started I don't know 10, 10 of the eighteen regular season games. Started in the playoffs. Had, had had a good season. Like it was it was nothing that was like Cameron Wake and I played up there at the same time. Oh, yeah. Cameron Wake was it was a rock star. Awesome. I mean he's yeah. he's putting up like twenty four sacks up there in a season. Yeah, it's crazy, That's unbelievable. Um, and it's harder for pass rushers because there's that yard That's neutral right, zone right up there. So you got to line up a yard off, off of the ball. ball. Yeah. Um, and so I, it wasn't like I lit up the stats, but I was an effective player and, and, and contributed on special teams. And I'm like, okay, I got a two year contract up here, and then I got an option, and I'm going to go back down and I'm going to play uh, play in the NFL. Like, great. So I come home, and and here's where like my journey and, and all this. Like, How old are you, Tyler? This I'm 20. So this is 2008. So I'm 24, almost 25. Mm. 24, 24. And so um, so I come home, and in the CFL, it's six months you're living there, and then six months you're completely off. And I had walked. I literally came home. I think I made thirty five thousand dollars for that season in Canadian dollars, which is like you lose twenty percent just coming home because oh. of the conversion rate. So I came home from Canada with like ten thousand dollars in my pocket, right after mm-hmm. conversion rate and all that stuff, and living up there. Um, and I come home and I'm like, God, I gotta do something. Like I can't just like train all the time. I mean, ten thousand dollars. I'm living with my parents, but like ten thousand dollars isn't going to go very far. Right. Um, so I started. I started training in the mornings, and then I went to. I started uh, working at an insurance broker, like selling personal lines insurance, like right. home, auto, all that stuff for a, a alumni of Fresno State. And so started doing that. And then I meet a girl named Tiffany, who I'd known through college, but like I met her, met her at mm. that point, right? And uh, we started dating. And it was one of those deals that like God put someone in your life at the exact right time. Right. Like I needed the motivation because again, my only motivation in life was football at that point. And so I half assed it through insurance. And it was like, I'm training and I'm just going to do this. And then I'm going to go run at lunch and I'm just going to do this. Well, I met Tiffany. I was like, now I have a bigger goal. Like mm. I have something bigger than myself. And it's not just for me. Now I want to provide for her. Right. And again, I mean, this was like the humility of it is like, you know, fast forward three months and I don't have any money. And I just started dating this girl and I had to ask Tiffany to borrow five hundred dollars just to get me through just to get me through the month. You asked your girlfriend for five hundred dollars. My girlfriend for five hundred dollars. And wow. Tiffany gave it to you? She gave it to me. And she what stayed with me afterwards. Goodness. Did she did you ever give her money back? I uh yes. She made it back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe you have. <laughs> 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 Okay. All so, right. So that's yeah. So so I mean, again, ego is hit. Well, right after that, and I'm working right now, like with the mindset of I got to buy her a ring, and I got to buy her a ring that she deserves. So to do that, 
and this is uh, okay. Hold on. So before that, I knew that I was going to marry her. All my goal is, is I'm, I'm going to get this. Girl How long ready. were you guys together before you were thinking of marriage? Oh, bro, like a week. And I'm like, I'm going to marry this girl. <laughs> no, I'm not even, maybe not even when a week. Know, after you know. the first date, after the first date, my you mom knew. told me she came in and, you know, she, my mom, like, it loves like, okay, what's going on? And I want to know what's, you know, everything that's happening. How are you feeling? And, and she said, like, you literally woke up with a smile on your face and you're like, mom, oh, yeah. this is the one for sure. That is awesome. Yeah. And so it was, it was immediately now like my, my goals changed, right. It's right. To, to provide a life for her that I felt like she deserved. And so, so that's what I did. And so now I picked up another job at a sports bar mm -hmm. at night. And so I was doing insurance during the day, training like early, early morning, lunchtime, doing my speed training, uh, going back to insurance and then going to the sports bar at night. Mm -hmm. And then, um, in May, so two weeks before I was supposed to report back to training camp in, in Canada, I got a call from the new head coach. They had changed over staffs and the new head coach was like, Hey, really sorry to do this. Uh, wish we could have met on better terms, but we're going to go ahead and have to let you go. Uh, just oh. not, just not a fit for our, our team mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm back on that green couch that I was. Wow. On that draft day, Are you kidding me? And I'm like, what? Like, mm. my only goal is to make it to the NFL. Now I'm not even good enough to play in Canada. Nothing against the league, but like, if I can't make it there, how am I going to make it right. in the NFL? Mm. So I'm sitting and I'm like, holy smokes, what do I do? And like now I've got like this other goal of like providing for this woman that I loved. And like, I can't do any of it. Like I'm broke. Mm. Like I just had to ask her for money and I'm just trying to save up for a ring. What, I mean, what am like, I'm just seriously like a, a, a moment with God. Like, what am I, what am I doing? Like, what mm. are you doing? And, and really started to feel sorry for myself at that point. And so I just kept on training. Um, and I spent in an, hopes of what, in hopes of an opportunity at that point. Did you have an agent at this point? Like where, where still the same your, agent yeah. still telling me that, Hey, you know, just don't think you're good enough, man. I mean, maybe you can keep working on long snapping. Mm. So I literally went to camps across the country. Every dollar that I made went to going to Salt Lake city, going to Orlando, going to Arizona, wow. going to Vegas. How many people told you over. to quit? How many people, family members, anyone tell you enough that's it i don't i don't know if i'd have heard it even if they said it like yeah. because i just get more pissed like like my head coach told me i couldn't play and then my agent told me i couldn't play and all these people around me i had a couple really good really good like supportive relationships like the guys that i trained with that like really kind of like hey keep doing this keep doing mm -hmm. this um but it was i mean it, like that dream just got further and further away every day that i there wasn't an opportunity but i mean I, literally every dollar that i made and so fast forward um, I had to uh, had to borrow six thousand dollars from my boss to get a, a wedding ring. Mm. Had to borrow it. Had oh to put goodness. yeah. So he did a line of credit, gave it to me, but I had to like pay him back. Um, so to just to get her a ring. So then we go through the wedding process because I couldn't wait to marry her. Like it was like I don't care what it is. Like I'm gonna marry you. So I'm trying to lock less you than up a year? before is you this figure like out a who year? I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is this like in a year? How long were you guys dating? So, yeah, one year to the day Wait. from our day, our first date to the day the day we got a married. year, one year. So I proposed after wow. seven months. I I'd, I'd finally gotten. You put that bang. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That bang up bang. <laughs> She. What do, what do you mean by that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it, it was one of those deals, and I'll, I'll say this about the relationship: like we waited till we got married before we had sex. So oh. that, that was a big. Oh, oh, he says, oh, 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 oh. oh and I'm go. not saying we believe you. I, and, <laughs> okay. Hey, as God is my witness, it's the truth. It is, and it was hard. Part of the reason everything was expedited, but like it was also good for us because like we actually got to know each other. Like it, it mm. wasn't that kind of hanging over us, right? right. Like it was like. All right, how far can we put? Okay, we got to stop. We just got to talk. You know, it right. was it was that relationship, but it was good for us because we actually got to know each other without that aspect. And I truly, I, you know what? Uh, I know Tiff. Yeah, and I absolutely believe that. Not 1, my choice, guys. One thousand percent. Because our very first conversation on the phone when, when we first started, dating, she goes. You know I'm not going to sleep with you, right? <laughs> oh like, my first gosh. conversation. Like, if you know Tiffany, she is direct. direct. And to yes, the point. Yes, She's yes, no filter. Yes. She goes, I'm not going to be one of those girls you dated in college. I'm not going to sleep <laughs> that with all, you. That Italian all, that Italian that is uh, came out. Yeah. Go all right. Tiff. Let's, let's do this. <laughs> okay. Let's get married quickly. Then. So, so we get married, but another ego hit, right, is like this woman that I love has to pay for her own wedding. 
Like she, mm. she had a really good job. She ran a spa out there and made enough money. Uh, I mean, we scrounged up some stuff. I had to like literally uh, get a second loan on my car to pay for the rest of our wedding. But like that was really the only contribution. We, our parents couldn't help us. They weren't mm. in a position to help. Um, so she literally had to pay twenty six thousand dollars of her own money for wow. her wedding. That's amazing. Like by herself. So then again, to speak to who she is, is we get back from our honeymoon that our aunt and uncle sent us on. Like that was their wedding gift. They were travel agents, sent us on a honeymoon. We get to, back to, literally. No, don't don't just go over that. To uh, Jamaica. Jamaica. Okay. Jamaica. Right. We did nice. uh, a sandals deal. It was nice. Probably, probably in Kingston. <laughs> <laughs> you stayed at Holiday Inn in Kingston. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Okay. And Jerry, this doesn't look like the pictures in the brochure. You, you didn't even see the beach the whole time, man. You're walking the streets. It don't matter. Uh, so, so we get back, and um, you know, now we're in this transitional life where, okay, now we're going to live together, right? Like we've got to go through that. But like, literally, the first conversation we have when we get back is she says, "Hey, look." I know you've been carrying this burden of football, and I know that I see how passionate you are. Like the fact that you're continuing to work the way that you are. Like I didn't see her really the last four months of our before our wedding because I was I was working working out in the morning, insurance during the day, training, running at lunch, insurance in the afternoon, sports bar at night, either sports bar or I was working at a pumpkin patch or Christmas tree lot right. to make anything that I could. And so she was like, I see the passion, I see how hard you're working. I want you to know I'm all in, whatever you gotta do. Like whatever wow. you got to do, because it was literally at the point where it's like, all right, do I hang them up and figure it out, or do I keep going? And she's like, I'm all in. Whatever you need, I'll keep working. Don't worry about it. Like I got you. And so I, I ended up changing agents at that point, um, and called another guy that worked for one of my uh, buddies that I played in Canada with, and he goes, Hey, look, you got to start at the bottom. You got to work your way up. I got, I can get you on an arena team right now. Like, do you want to do it? I was like, all right, let's do it. So a week and a half after I get married, I go to Salt Lake City. Sorry, you may have you may have just said this, but how many years post your last football so, game was this? So this was this was February of two thousand ten and my last football game was like December two thousand seven. Well, okay, Canada was Thanksgiving two thousand eight. So this is two years oh after my, my last game. Mm. Wow. So two years after my last game, and my eight the my new agent was like, All right, let's get going. So I flew out to Salt Lake City and I you know, go play out there. And this was the first year the Arena League was back. So we we're making like 500 bucks a month. Right. Um, they would pay, they put us up uh, in an a, uh, apartment. I had like four or five roommates. But like our food, because I couldn't afford food, was hey, here's, here's 100 subway vouchers, live off a of subway. So I literally wow. lived off a of subway while I was in the Arena League. And uh, still to this day, I, I look at subway sandwiches very differently. <laughs> Grilled, grilled, ch- grilled chicken, six inch, man. Can't do it. Can't, Can't do, do it. it. <laughs> so, so uh, I go out there and I'm out there for six weeks. And um, I, I mean, if I'm if I'm being transparent, I hated arena ball. It was really hard. Did you? Yeah, it was just it was like playing in your living room, and it was just different rules. And I was playing middle linebacker, and I was playing fullback, and uh, and so. Um, it was literally like, okay, middle linebacker, you just run and pass rush and go heads with a fullback. Fullback, you sit there, middle linebacker runs and goes heads so with you. So all game long. All game that's long. That's what you're doing. That's just Oklahoma yeah, drill. That's 100% for, what are it is. Oh, you playing both ways as well? Oh, yeah. I was playing uh, middle linebacker and I was playing fullback. <laughs> oh, my god. And gosh. so that was that was six weeks. And I was like, this is – there's zero football. I literally would move a grand total of six yards of play, like <laughs> max. It was like I'm stepping up for two yards. I'm hitting – I made like chase night, the play dude. down. So it was. I, I didn't like it at all. But it, what it did is it gave me credibility that I could go play. You know, I mm. still played special teams and I did some of that stuff. I was the long snapper in the arena league. And so, um, so what it did is on my bye week, six weeks later, every dime that we had, I bought a plane ticket mm. to go back home to be with Tiffany. But also, there was three workouts that weekend. There was one in Fresno Friday night for a CFL team, the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. There was a workout in San Diego Saturday morning at seven a.m. Which is a seven-hour drive from Fresno. There's no yes. And then there is another one Saturday night for the Las Vegas Locomotives, which is the UFL. The Saturday, both Saturday workouts were for UFL teams, which was the developmental league yeah. that, that uh, was up for a little bit. And so, again, the wife that that Tiffany was, I was like, "Hey, I know we haven't seen each other in six weeks, but I've got three workouts scheduled mm. that I got to go to. So, you want to go?" And she's like, "Yeah, let's go." So and you so, fly back. So I work out. Right. I don't even shower because I've got to get on the road 
because I'm like, well, I can't drive all night right. and then just go you right to out. the workout right. because it was a seven hour drive. So I finished the workout at like eight o'clock. I think we grabbed something to eat and we got on the road. Now, mind you, the last dollar that we had that month was spent on plane tickets and gas. So did not have a dollar. So we drive down, we get down there like two in the morning and can't stay anywhere. So like we've got to sleep in our car Mm because I can't afford to stay in a hotel. So we're sleeping in in our car before a workout. Like, and I'm, and I'm literally laying there and this was like the pivotal moment I think in my journey was, it was like, what am I doing? Like, what am I doing? Like this woman that deserves so much more than this is sleeping in the back of her car I'm going around, going to these workouts, like, what am I doing? But what that did, though, is I went into that workout with that. Like, that mentality. You carry that. She deserves better than yeah. this, and I'm going to give her better than this. And here is an opportunity. I'm not just going to go to a workout and go through it, which I, I always worked hard, but it was a different mindset. Mm-hmm. Whereas I walked into this, I was like, no, nobody's going to be better than me. I'm going to work harder than everybody, and I'm, I'm going to make this team. And so I worked out that Saturday, and I worked out as a linebacker. And so this is kind of crazy. So I'll, still I'm thinking, okay, hey, defense, linebacker, because of my size, and that's probably where I'm going to have to have to be. I don't have any film as a fullback other than like heads-up blocking in the arena league. Mm-hmm. And so I go and I do some coverage routes. Well, there was a bunch of linebackers there. There was not any running backs. There was like four or five running backs. So those guys got gassed. So I was like, dude, that line's way shorter. I'm going to go get in that one. <laughs> So I went in game. and I just yeah, started yeah. running routes. Yeah. That's brilliant. And so I'm I'm running routes and I beat some of these linebackers and I caught all the balls and like I, I don't know if it was back in my day as as a quarterback, but like I just, I just caught the ball well. Right. And so and I didn't think anything of it and then I long snapped too. So they had me on their on their list as a long snapper before anything else. So then I go and I work out in LA. Excuse me. And I go work out in LA and then um, and I get on a plane that night and go back because we had to be at practice on Monday and right. I, wanna, I couldn't get a flight on Sunday. Okay. So I fly back and then again. By all this time, you're, when you fly back to Salt Lake, mm-hmm. Tiffany's still in Fresno. Tiffany is staying in Fresno working because everything that she makes is what it's we have to pay out. our oh, rent, and tickets, and all, all of that, right? Goodness. Because I'm making enough literally to eat, like to whatever I don't eat at yeah, Subway is like mode. going to that. Yeah. And so, like, again, it's just. Yeah, it's hard when you first get married. And so, and all I wanted to do was be with her. So I get a call back the next week from the CFL team that I worked out on Friday as a DN. Mm-hmm. And then also from the UFL team that Saturday morning workout in San Diego. The CFL team says, hey, we want to offer you a contract and we're going to give you a $5,000 signing bonus. I'm like, hello. I'll yes, take it. Right. You know, like <laughs> that's more money. <laughs> the dumb and dumber. We'll take it. <laughs> that's more money. Still to this day would be the biggest signing bonus that I ever got. Still no to this way. day. To yeah. this day? To this day. Wow. Even with your time in the NFL, that's never, still ne- never got a signing bonus. Okay, keep going. Yeah. Keep going. I'm sorry. Dude, this so, is unreal. So uh <laughs> so I go, yeah, 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 for sure. And I like call Tiffany and I'm like, hey, you won't believe it. CFL called, like they offered me a contract. We got a signing bonus. How awesome is this? She goes, like, not real excited. And I'm like, what? I'm like, pregnant. Are you serious? Mm. Not yet. Oh, I was about to and, say. And, I was like, oh, I mean, this is great. She goes, it's just really hard, Tyler. Like, I mean, going back to Canada, like, what's the end game? Like, what are you thinking? Like, is that just going to, are you going to stay there? Because it's going to be really hard to be in, you know, the U.S., in California and in Canada. Yeah, right. And it's like, you're not going to make enough there that, like, I can stop working. So now are we going to spend six months apart? How's that going to, how's that going to work? I'm like, but it's, I mean, it's my dream, you know, right. like it's what it is. She's like, I, look, you got to do what you got to do, and I 100% support you. But I just, you know, I, well, let's just think about it. Well, literally right after that call, I got a call from Mike McDaniels, who was the running back coach. And and I, and I brought up relationships earlier, right? right? And everything was out of my control. But from the from the UFL team that I worked on, uh, worked out for that Saturday morning, he calls and he says, hey, uh, don't have any interest uh, we're not going to sign you sign you right now but we want to work you out again not as a linebacker i want to see you really as a fullback hmm. and i'm like really i mean just got caught a couple balls well long story short is there was a long snapper at fresno state that my first agent repped who uh kevin murphy who was a scout for the texans this running back coach was quality control at the texans two years before mm-hmm. this guy had watched me at fresno state and he was like hey i think this guy like built is built like a fullback i'd love to see him if there's an opportunity to see him as a fullback and he's with the texans 
And so he calls him. I don't know. Somehow they were talking. And Mike McDaniels is like, hey, you heard, ever heard of this Tyler Klutz kid? He was a Fresno. He goes, yeah, 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 for sure. I always wanted to see him as a fullback. Because mm. we were thinking about working him out as a fullback. And he's like, do it for sure, because I really want to see him. Right. And if it wasn't for that connection and relationship, you know, however far off it was, I don't know if they would have called me back to work awesome. me out. So what I had to do was I had to decide, because the CFL said, hey, this contract's on the table to end a day tomorrow. And the workout wasn't until the next weekend. Right. And so I said, I got to pass on the CFL contract. It was really hard to do, to take a chance to go to this other workout in the UFL. And I also, in order to do that, I had to walk away from the Arena League. So there was an out. If you had an opportunity to move up, you could get out of your contract okay, in the right. Arena So League. where was this workout in for the UFL? Sacramento. So it was only two and a half hours away from Fresno. So right. Tiff's like, that's amazing. Like... We got it. We got to see this through. She goes, and it's a position that you could progress in. Like this is something that you could totally do. And I'm this dumb football player. Is like, nah. I just, I just want to. I just want to <laughs> hit the quarterback. To hit people. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so I go to this workout, and it, and it all worked out. Um, and and they end up signing me. Um, you know, and that that led into going into training camp in Sacramento. The incumbent fullback. Um, something worked out there that not worked out. And sorry. John, um, but he had some head issues, and so mm-hmm. he had to retire because he had some concussion issues. Um, so that opened up a spot. I ended up winning it, uh, winning the job, and then I started that whole season in the UFL, and it was a great year. Dante Culpepper was our quarterback. Okay, uh, I mean, it, uh, Danny, you know, the late great Danny Green was our Danny head Green coach. was the head coach. Yeah, um, uh, was it, was it Denzel's it, son? Denzel, on? John David Washington. Yeah, yeah. 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 So he's still a good buddy. So yeah. I just talked to him a couple weeks ago, uh, but. It was a great league. It was really good talent. I'd say 75% of every roster had played on an NFL roster mm-hmm. at some point. Um, but it was a good opportunity for me to learn the game. But it was hard. I mean, it was hard going back to, to offense after spending right. so much so time, time on, on defense. defense yeah. um, so I played. Well, I finished the season, and the Cleveland Browns call me. Oh, Say, sorry, I'll just, just pause real quick. You so keep at, showing me the clock, so I'm trying to no, move through. Sorry. At, at this point... Was the dream closer? You mentioned earlier the dream kept getting further and further away. At this point, did you start to see some light at the end of the tunnel, yeah, there, or were there, you still kind of thinking it was still it was still really far off, right? Like, and I because I'd watched the, the NFL for three and a half years since I got out of college, mm-hmm. like, and it's like these guys are so much better than than what I'm playing at right now. Like, I don't know if I still can ever. I still would watch NFL games and get nervous and get literally get nervous just because I'm watching like. Hey, am I good enough to play with those guys? I, right. I don't know if I'm good enough to play with those guys. But through that process, Mike McDaniel's my running back coach. Like he had, he was a young guy. He reminds me a lot of um, like Sean McVay. He actually was in, uh, he's actually in Washington for a while, but he was a Mike Shanahan guy. Mm-hmm. So, and I think a Kyle Shanahan, and I think he was kind of that younger guy, uh, was really, really smart, went to Duke. Um, and, but like the entire time, he's like, dude, you're going to be in the league someday. You're going to be in the league. You can do. You can. You're going to be in the league someday. Man, and I'm like, no way. There's no way. Like I've never even played this position before. Like he goes, I'm telling you, you're going to be in the league someday. So to your point, I think it started to come like into creeping in my mind. Like okay, like I'm actually making some progress here. Um, and so, so I finished the season. Cleveland Browns call. The only reason that I got signed with the Cleveland Browns is because Eric Mangini is a Belichick guy. Mm-hmm. My head coach, Pat Hill, was a Belichick guy. Pat Hill and Mangini coached on the same staff for the Browns. So did Pat Coach Hill end up calling Mangini? No, but he knew that I played for him. Mm. And he knew that I was a linebacker, defensive end, and he knew that I was obviously a fullback. So they signed me to practice squad because that's one less spot that they have to fill right. on practice squad because now I was the practice squad fullback and the practice squad middle linebacker. And so, dude, you're you're totally just skipping over. <laughs> I mean, what in the world did that feel like? Yeah, to go from, I mean, literally this whole journey. I know you. I've known you. I know you well. Yeah. And this story is blowing me away. Yeah. Listening to this, it's a lot, man. It's what so, we, the, we don't we don't have enough time to like. It's there's so much more like? wrapped into this. Yeah. yeah. But what was that like to sign yeah. an NFL contract after all this time? It was crazy. It was it was absolutely crazy because for you know let, let's just say high school college so we're talking about nine years mm-hmm. there right so nine years there and then three years in between all I wanted was an opportunity 
All I wanted was to sign that contract with the NFL Shield on top of it. That's right. all I wanted. That's all I could ask for. Right. And then finally, like, I got there. I, you know what? Damn you. <laughs> what was the conversation like with Tiff when <sighs> you got that call? So the call, like, when she lost her mind was my agent called me and said, hey, um, got some good news. Um, Cleveland wants to wants to fly you out for a workout, and she was with me oh, uh, you know, oh. on speakerphone, and like you could just see like it, she'd put in so much to this, right? Yeah. Like as much or more than I did up to that point, mm -hmm. and like the amount of of uh, sacrifice that she made, like you could just see like, but it was crazy because like I'm looking at her, and all she could like do is be happy for me. Like Tyler got to reach his uh, goal, like crazy. he got to do this, and like, but like emotional about it like not like oh that's awesome i'm happy Dude, for you i'm getting emotional it Seriously. was like <laughs> and so yeah. so i remember sitting in, in, our, in, the, in the house that we were renting at the time in in our bedroom and uh it was like late afternoon so it was before you turn the light switch on but mm -hmm. like the shades are kind of open so you got a little bit of light i just i remember it exactly and i remember walking towards the closet when he called me and and she was just there and it was just like the overwhelming joy, just to have the opportunity. And I didn't even, honestly, I didn't even need to sign a contract. I just needed to get in front of NFL coaches. Mm, yeah. And so I go and I worked out for them. And, um, and, and then I call her. And by the way, this was early December. And so it was like three weeks left in the season, four weeks left in the season. And, um, and I call her and I'm like, hey, good news and bad news. It's like, good news. Bad news is I'm not going to be home for Christmas. Good news is they do want to sign me. Oh, my goodness. So, so, you know, stayed in Berea, Ohio, yep. um, out at the facility, and it was... That was sorry. the other bad news. You had to be in Ohio. That, that was it. That's, that's true. <laughs> it was cold. Like, balls cold. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it was awful. Uh. Awful. And I remember, too, like, and it was it was, it was, was so fun, and it was so awesome. I mean, the team, we were, like, we had just it had a good year. That was Peyton Hillis when he had had that big yeah. year mm -hmm. in 2010. And so, um, you know, there was hype, but then they lost the last three games, got knocked out of the playoff contention. So it was like, you know that depressing, like, yeah. that slide it's at the end with, of the season? Yeah. Yeah. You and know so, it's over. And you knew Mangini was on his way out, too. Right. And he was the guy that got me in, but I remember going to Christmas or going to the movies on Christmas by myself because I didn't know enough guys on the team. I only been there a couple of weeks, and I remember it was like, well, I'm not going to spend money getting a taxi, so I'm going to walk. So I walked like a mile and a half in the snow to go to a movie to watch a movie by myself on Christmas Day, and then walk to a diner and had Christmas by myself. And I remember just thinking like this. This is not what no, I thought it was going to be. Yeah. But you think about it. Right? Think about this. I mean, people, the perception yeah. of every football player is loaded. Oh. Or every professional athlete is just loaded with money. I oh. mean, you're a guy that's you're there for the last, what, four weeks of yeah. the season? Yeah. And you're on the practice squad practice as well. Squad. So I'm making like six grand, six grand a week before tax. So that's good money. Right. That's more money than we ever had. But we had all the debt from the wedding. We mm. had the debt from the ring. So literally, like, everything I made, like, we're, we're getting out. We're getting yeah. out. Get it out, right? right. So, like, it, it wasn't like I walked out of there. And it's funny. I remember signing the practice squad and, like, Tiff posting something on Facebook. <laughs> and... I swear. We made it! Hey, hey, for real. But, like, you know, I, again, proud wife, but I, I had, I had, oh, I don't know, probably 10 to 15 people. Hey, bro, hey, I got this idea oh, over yeah. the gym. <laughs> like, guys that I, like, went to junior high with that I'd never heard from, or they were just from Fresno, right? Like, oh, hey, no. I'd love for you to invest yeah. in this. Yeah. Like, I got 20 on it. Like, <laughs> I'll give you 20 bucks because that's all I got. Like, that's not the case. Uh, so, and, and, and I'm going to fast forward through kind of the rest of it, but I ended up spending six years in the NFL. Um, you know, a lot of transition, more examples of Tiffany being a rock star. Mm -hmm. Like we got, uh, got traded to Chicago week from, one from, Gle from Cleveland, from Cleveland. All right. So the from next Cleveland. year, did you come back the next year? I came back. We went through the lockout. So we were out. So okay. we did not have an off season. Wow. New staff came in. Mangini got fired. New staff came in and then, um, they had drafted a kid out of Stanford in the fourth round to play fullback. Uh -huh. He was a good player. Um, so they drafted him. So I'm like. And that was another low moment, right? Back yeah. to that green couch. All that right. work, all is, that time. And, then, and I'm watching the draft, and they draft Owen Marisic from Stanford, who was a two-way player. He was, uh, he was like scored the fastest two touchdowns in college history. He had an interception for a touchdown, or, a full, or he had a, a, a fullback dive for a touchdown, kicked it off, pinned him back at like five-yard line, and had interception and for a touchdown. Wow. So it was like four seconds on the clock between, mm. between scores. And so um, – and so they drafted, and I remember sitting in my shower in my house in, in Fresno, and uh, and just like crying. It's like dreams over. Like I got mm. no shot. Like I got no film, no NFL film. I got no opportunity. Um, but 
you know, luckily I, I came in and I had a really good relationship with Colt McCoy, uh, Seneca Wallace, who lives here in Dallas now, mm-hmm. um, but had a good training camp, had a really, really good training camp. Uh, and I was starting to get comfortable in that position of fullback. And so I, I, a good enough training camp to where they signed me to the practice squad. Uh, Miami called and Chicago called and Cleveland said, "Hey, we're gonna pay, we'll pay you full salary to stay on the practice on the squad. practice squad wow. because we're gonna have you active in a week or two max. But we don't want to lose you. But we cannot. We don't have a roster spot week one mm-hmm. because that's when you've got to protect your roster, right. right? So again, wisdom of my wife is Chicago called and said you're starting this week." Mm. And Miami called and said, "Hey, we want to sign you to our practice squad. You can go laterally, but mm. you can't. You can't." Um, uh, and so uh, Tiffany was like, "Babe, we're I'm 26 at this point, by right. the way, 26 year old." And she's like, uh, "We maybe need to think about like where should you play? Like you, they can't guarantee you a spot right now, but Chicago can. Right? And and how it sounds, and you're you've playing. Got you're not playing. a side way. No, you're no, playing. You're starting yeah. against what Atlanta kind of Falcons. I was going to say, what, that's, that's where was the decision? decision? I'm confused what the decision because, was. That's concussions. Because. Those are that, that yeah. you know. Hey, for real, <laughs> <that> arena <laughs> league time. Go, play. But, yes. but the decision was is that it was hard because I had become really attached to that staff, and they really did show me love, and they really did like – like the coach, all of the coaches, and 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 this isn't. They're like, you should be our starter. Like you need. Like we want mm. you here. Like you are. You should be the starter. We drafted him. There's nothing we can do. But you should be our guy. So I was like, I, I liked it. I know the system. I know I like the system. Like mm. I actually started to like Cleveland, and it was and it was like it was hard because for the first time I was truly wanted for football, and I mm. felt like, all right, right like somebody, li- yeah. somebody likes me now. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it was hard. And and but then it was Tiff was like. We got to do something. You got to get active. Like you can't wait another year. Right. So I was like, all right, let's do it. So Tuesday Why afternoon, are you even I'm paying an agent. Just pay Tiffany. You should have just paid seriously. Hey, you don't know dollars. how many times we've had that conversation. I would have been a lot different place in my career if I <laughs> had Tiffany be my agent. <laughs> so so she uh, so wait, so we go to Chicago, start that week, um, and then had an awesome year in Chicago. Loved Chicago. It was my first year. Um, loved it. Really connected with Matt Forte. Yeah. He had uh, for his first Pro Bowl year that year. I mean, it was awesome. And Chicago in the fall is an amazing yeah, place to be. Good. It really is. So I loved it. So I went through the season and then training camp the next year. You know, I'm going to be the starter and we're going to have another repeat performance. Matt had, he got hurt in week 10, but he had 1,100 yards in, mm. in 10 weeks. And so it was like a solid, solid showing. And then, um, I get traded to Houston week one. So Tuesday, oh. I get traded, and now, now we got to go to Houston. So I'm like, crap. Okay, so I had to learn a Cleveland's playbook. I had to learn Cleveland's original playbook with Mangini. Then I had to learn Shermer's playbook. And then I had to learn Mike Martz's playbook. Mm-hmm. Now I got now I got to go to Houston. Now I got to learn Kubiak's playbook. Right. Like, this is a matter of literally like two years, like a two year calendar window, right? And so then I go there and and it wasn't the year that I wanted. Um, you know, they brought me in to be the guy. I played, I played special teams a lot. I played, you know, a handful at fullback, but like wasn't the guy. Um, and matter of fact, there was a tight end that played more. Ended up going to the Pro Bowl that year mm. at that kind of flexy Flex type thing, guy, James right. Casey. Um, but we had a great year that year. We went to the playoffs. We ended up losing uh, to New England in the divisional round. So then I go to the next year, and I get traded to Miami Week One. So wow. now I go to Miami. And so now Tiff's got to go to Miami. And all this time, by the way. Yeah, she traveling. Tiffany traveling. So from Houston on. So Chicago, she stayed home. Right. And because we were pregnant with our first, with Giada. Ah, Okay. When I was in Chicago. So we were going to give birth there. She was still working. She worked up to the day that we gave birth to her, November 21st. Mm -hmm. So that was a crazy story for another podcast. But but so then, so now Gia's one and a half. I got to ask, were you there for the pregnancy? Not the pregnancy. I was there for the birth. We were there for the birth, no, though. flew in an hour. I literally landed an hour from Chicago. We had a Sunday night game against San Diego in yeah. Chicago and couldn't get any flights out going to California after the game. So I left at 5 a.m. And I remember we flew. Uh, I flew to Salt Lake City and then connected to Fresno. And Fresno is really bad in the winter, fall with fog. Fog, yeah. So you can't land planes in it. So I remember our, the hospital that we were at is kind of like on the outskirts of town. And we were... We were circling because we couldn't land. Mm. And when I landed in uh, Salt Lake City, um, 
her mom was like, yeah, she's got about an hour and a half because they just induced her. Mm. And so like, she's already dilated past a three. So uh-huh. like, it's going to start moving really quickly. So it's like an hour and a half flight from Salt Lake city to Fresno. And I'm like, holy smokes. So I'm circling, looking at the hospital that's not in the fog, but the airport is, we're literally circling right here. And I'm like, dude, I got to jump out of this plane. Like, like right. I got to get there. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And then uh, I ended up making it about an yeah, forty five minutes before my oh, daughter man. was born. So yeah. I was there for about twenty four hours, and then I went back to Chicago. Oh my gosh! So uh, so anyway, so we go through this, and then we're pregnant with our second with Luca, right. um, and uh, and so I get a call from my agent. He's like, "Hey, we're going to South Beach," and I'm like, "What?" He goes, "Yeah, I just got traded. <laughs> well, let's go." <laughs> and I'm like, I, "Just go, yeah." And he's like, they're going to call you. So they call me five minutes. Miami calls me five minutes. They're like, hey, you got a flight in two hours. And I'm on the south side of Houston. You got to go up to George Bush. Mm. And that's that's an hour yeah, and 20 minutes. Absolutely. At least, right? So they've already booked your flight. You traded. You're, it. you're yeah, done. Yeah. Right. yeah, because we got practice tomorrow, right? This is this is Wednesday Ruth, practice. Man, this, is, this is a world I have Good. no... You know, yeah, this no. Is, I'm serious. I've this played 13 be, years yeah. in the league. And I, I'm, I'm, this is a world that I just... This couldn't be any more different than what you went through. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so go on. So you get to Miami. Yeah, so get to Miami. And Tiff, who's six months pregnant and has a, a almost two-year-old, right. um, has to pack up our entire house and move. So like, luckily, we had some people in the church that came and helped her. But like, she packed up an entire house, shipped it over, shipped a car, did all that. Whereas like, now I'm like deep into the playbook, trying to understand because I'm starting on Sunday. Sunday, right. And so, yeah, man, learned that. And uh, so I get there five weeks into the season. Uh, we're playing a Monday night game and, uh, and had a bunch of defensive guys go down. Um, and on Tuesday, which for those of you guys that know, so there's a cutoff line on Tuesday at, at 4 p.m. Eastern time that all wires have to be in by 4 o'clock mm-hmm. or you are active on that week or you count towards the roster that week. Right. So – Late night, Monday night, coming in from New Orleans, um, in the weight room at like 3.45, finishing up a workout. And we had late late meetings that night. And the Reaper comes in. Oh. Mm. Right. And the Reaper comes in, and he's like, hey, uh, Brad wants to see you upstairs. I was like, all right, cool. Like, I got two more sets. I'm almost done. And uh, and I played well. You're on the point. bench. Yeah. You're benching right now. You're in the weight room benching. Oh, literally on my back <laughs> benching. And he's like, hey, Brad wants to see you upstairs. I'm on my back. Like not even just like walking around. I'm on my back. He goes, hey, Brad wants to see you right now. And I was like, all right, cool. And he goes, no, no, no. Brad now. being the GM. The GM, Brad Ireland. Yeah. And so uh, I was like. Oh, you knew something was up. This isn't good. So I kind of like take my time. And I look. And I'm like, these these dudes, yeah, you can like cold blooded, yeah, cold blooded, right? And so I go in and um, I like kind of change, get out of my sweaty shirt, and I, I walk up to Brad's office, and he's like looking at the clock, and he's like, "Hey, man, I really hate to do this, and this is you played well for us, you did really good, but we got a bunch of defense guys go down, and like I'm like, dude is trying to get this out before the or, clock, absolutely, he's trying to beat the time, and I'm like, just so they don't have to pay me, pay me for that week, exactly, and I'm like. All right, dude. Yes, you know hey, what? We'd man? love for you to stay. We don't want you to stay because we'll sign you back. Like I live in California. And we talk. I mean, people, the fan. You know, look. I, I this is the business of the NFL. Yeah. That's the true business of the NFL. And and we always talk about loyalty, loyalty to the team. And the fans are always hating on players. For Jeff, being, not, yeah, I mean, and and this is this is the truth, man. This is like behind the curtain stuff. Yeah. I mean, they're they don't want to pay you for this week, so they're trying to cut you right now to get you out of the building. Yeah. And I and I made a mistake. It was Jeff. That's how bad Jeff I Ireland. Yeah. Jeff Ireland, not yep. Brad. Yep. I, my buddy in high school was Brad Ireland. Um, so so yeah. And and you're and you're right, right? Like it is truly a business. Yes. Like it is all about. You are a commodity, commodity as a player, and that is it. And it's there's there was zero emotion. It is like, hey, we got to do this. And I understand it. If I was in charge of a team, like, and that's my role and that's my job as a general manager, like, the general manager is not a coach. The general manager is a numbers guy. Absolutely. Like, that is who he is. Mm-hmm. So he's so disconnected with it, right? Mm-hmm. He doesn't necessarily know football X's and O's, but he knows, hey, to it make has. our cap, to hit our roster numbers, to make sure that I give what the coaches are telling me they need, I've got to do this. Yeah. You just, I've always looked at GMs and been like, they have yeah. no soul, man. Kind of no heart. It is strictly a numbers game, and you are a commodity. You're done, and it's a hard on. job, right? Yeah, it it is. is. It's a hard job, and I'm not. I'm not discounting that. And it, you know, as a player, it sucks, right? Yeah. It sucks being on that side of it. Um, but you know, I, I hope, and my hopes are that there is something behind those guys that, like, damn, this 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 part of the job really this does suck. suck. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so anyway, so at that point, uh, we had to pack up and we had to move back to California. And we didn't know. We're like, okay, we don't have anywhere to go. And this is the first time I've been out, like since I got in the league, that I was out in the middle of the season. And so shipped shipped everything back. My wife's pregnant. We had just had our furniture delivered. Like everything was there. Two now we babies, what do we two do? Kids. Yeah. Not yet. She's like seven, seven months, months pregnant, pregnant right? at this point. Okay. And this flight home from Miami, y'all, was hell. So first of all, like I'm getting cut. Now I got to go home, and I don't know what I'm going to do. Like I don't have any activity. I, I cleared waivers. Where are you going to live when you get back home? We had a house in California. Okay. So yeah. So we we did buy a house in Clovis, California, our mm. hometown. So we get uh, thirty minutes into the flight. And Giada, so Tiff's pregnant, like super pregnant, and Giada gets sick. And she's what, one? One or? and almost two. Right. So this is this is uh, October, and her birthday's in November, almost two. And she throws up all over the plane. And this isn't like a like baby spit up. This is like grown adult, like throw up, like the and smell, the like? gross, like projectile, <laughs> Did right? She her head turn? Like the, all the way around. <laughs> it, it felt like that, right? Uh. So we literally had to take four and a half hours. We had to strip the sheets, the the seats off, take the covers off, and sit on the metal oh. on the chairs oh for the rest gosh. of the flight home, smelling like puke, and then everyone else hating us because uh, we were those people all from on the plane. Miami all after the way I got, after I got cut. <laughs> Yeah. You can't make this up. You can't, man. So, so anyways, uh, you know, again, I'm going to fast forward here because we're we're short on time, but I I get home, I'm home for eight weeks, and now I'm back on that green couch. Like, Mm. I'm like, holy smokes. Like, what am I going to do? Like, I know I have ball left in me. I'm playing the best ball of my life. Like, there's something left in me. And I sat at home for eight weeks. I was home for uh, phone didn't ring. No. Yeah. Eight weeks of the season didn't ring. Didn't ring. And then my running back coach, who was in Cleveland, was now in Dallas. And so Thanksgiving, right after the Thanksgiving game in 2013, um, so they were struggling running the ball. They had a rough, cold schedule ahead of them. So like, we got to figure out how to run the ball here right. with DeMarco. And so uh, Gary Brown called and was like, hey, man, we want to work you out. Like, you need to get out here. And so uh, it was it, Tiffany and I had just gotten in like the biggest fight that day. And she wasn't even talking to me. And I was hanging Christmas tree lights uh, with my dad. And we'd gotten a big fight because I was just like in a rut. And I was just like, you got to snap out of it. Like, you can't be like this. So she didn't want to talk to me. And then she comes out and she goes, Tyler, your agent's on the phone. He's been trying to call you. And I'm like. Oh, that's how she gave it to you. Oh, dude. Oh, yeah. Salty. Yeah, super right. salty. And so uh, so I climbed down. And then she's like, so it's good news? What? And I was like, yeah, Dallas wants to work me out. So. We got over the fight. Uh, <laughs> she's not the type to just ignore it. Right. But she's like, okay, now we can actually talk about it. Right. Like, we'll, right. we'll move through. Yeah. So, anyways, so I go to Dallas, spend three years in Dallas, and you know, it was ups and downs when I was in Dallas. Um, you know, highlight of the ups and downs is uh, we had a great season in fourteen. That was the game, the Des caught it game. game. Yeah, he uh, caught it. Playoffs, yep. he caught it. Mm-hmm. I, I had a touchdown that game. Yeah. It was like, oh, this is awesome. You know, the next year's first, gonna be first, first touchdown, touchdown in, the in the NFL. Oh, wow. That's got to be mm. awesome. So, it, I mean, in Lambeau Field, it was amazing, amazing. And then it turns the other way. And, like, he couldn't enjoy that because that loss of the team was, oh, man. Yeah. I've only cried in two games. And it was my, my senior, my senior, uh, the last game of my senior year when we won the Central Section Championship mm-hmm. in California. And then that game. That game. Because it was like, yeah. I was so crushed for, for Tony, for Witt, for Dez, for all of the guys on that roster that like busted their ass that year. Yeah. And it was like to come up short like that, it, it hurt. It hurt. Um, but after that season, I'm thinking, okay, hey, had a great year. DeMarco set the single season rushing record, mm-hmm. played well, played well mostly the like second two thirds of the season. Um, but like, it's like, all right, this is great. And so Dallas says, um, I, I, my contract was up. Dallas says, hey, we think you're going to. You've been here how many years? Two years. You've been there two years. Two okay. years at that point. Okay. And uh, and Dallas is like, hey, we can't we can't afford you? Um, we're going to sign another guy. I'm like, whoa, hold on. <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah, you haven't even asked afford- yet. <laughs> what are you talking? What are you talking about? <laughs> uh, and uh, and my agent had asked like something. I mean, we're talking minimal, like very minimal. Like, hey, let's guarantee a small portion of this one year contract mm. or whatever. We had taken anything. Um, because, but we did think there was going to be more activity and leverage and there wasn't. And so, uh, so they ended up signing a kid out of Detroit, um, and, and said, sorry, man, like this is, this is goodbye. Thanks for, thanks for what you did. 
And it was like, what? And so relationships with like Romo and Witten and Jason yeah. Garrett. And I ran into Jason Garrett a couple times because we had we had a, a lease here in Dallas that we just stayed here and trained a little bit until free agency. And um, and I saw them a couple times and Jason was like, stay ready, stay ready, stay ready. Mm. And um, so it was time and it'd been, you know, three or four weeks after they signed the kid and they started showing up for workouts and I wasn't here. So I was like, all right, we got to go home. So we drove home back to California with all our stuff. I get a call a week later from Dallas. They're like, "Hey, uh, made a mistake. I want to sign you back." And I was like, "Sure, I, I'm back I, on. I don't it. care. Yeah. You're like I the dog, care. man. You're like that dog. You, the dog now. got spanked. Don't, yeah. yeah, it's just <laughs> hey, yes, sir. I'm about yes, sir. right back yes, on sir. it. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, but it was it was like the craziest deal because because I mean guys like Romo who you know. Romo's not like a 21 personnel fullback guy. Like, that's not his deal. But, like, the relationships that we made in this locker room, he went to Steven. Jason Garrett went to Steven. Witt went to Steven. It was like, you need to get him back. Like, mm. he's more than just a, a fullback for us. Like, he's, you know, contributes in the locker room. He does these other things. So, again, I, I brought back earlier in this about relationships, right? right. There were so many of these moves and transitions that were completely out of my control. Had I not had those relationships, yeah. then none of those things would have happened. And I'd be in Fresno, which great. Fresno's not a bad place, but like I would not have gotten to experience the things that I did with my wife, Tiffany, and my kids, and both my kids being able to watch me play football. I, I tell you what, there, in your story, there's so much loyalty that, that I mean, <laughs> Tiffany's a rock star. Bro. Oh my gosh. Don't yes. even know. I mean, I've always known she's, she's a great woman, but man, just to hear your story. I mean, pe everyone needs to hear this story. Absolutely. Because this is not, I mean, this is, I mean, and there's a, probably a lot of people that have gone, a lot of players that have gone this way or mm -hmm. have had these obstacles that they had. But what we hear are the stories of the first round picks and we see the draft and mm -hmm. these guys come out with these new suits. And, you know, that's what, that's what everyone sees. They don't see these type of stories mm. that are just so real. And so yeah. true, man. Huh. I'll say this, man. I, it, there's hundreds of takeaways from this story. And, and like we said earlier, I mean, Darren and I, we've known you, Tyler, now for, what, two or three years? Yeah. And, and I'm just uh, – my, my jaw's on the floor. I can't believe this story. Mm. It is unbelievable. The resilience you showed, the, the stick to if you will. Mm. I mean, just uh, – it's just mind-blowing. It really yeah. is. Here's, yeah. The, here's the other thing that I'll, I'll, I'll share with that. Like you say, like your resilience and the stick with it and all that. Um, you know, I don't know if you caught it, but a lot of my story, it was like, I worked really hard. I had right. to work harder than everyone else. I had to do this. It wasn't until like I grew in my faith and I grew, um, you know, knowing Jesus Christ and his plan for me was he did all those things intentionally, right? Mm. It wasn't the hard work. Like he had prepared me because had I come straight out of college and been that kid and got in the NFL, I wouldn't have, I would not be in Dallas today talking right. to you guys, right? There's a reason that I had to go through all that. There right. was an appreciation that I thought I had, that I had to, I had to go through those trials in order for me to actually get to those other things. And it was not my doing. I mean, just the, the, the amount of people that impacted it. There's no coincidence in that. And God was preparing me through all that. If I had gone to the NFL, I wouldn't have married Tiffany. Right. There's I, would not be, yeah. I, I would not have married her. Yeah. And I would not have the four beautiful children that I have today. And I would not work alongside some of the most amazing men that I've yeah. ever been around. And it's there's so many things that like I'm so thankful for because of that journey, not because of how hard I worked, but because of the plan that was laid out for mm -hmm. me. And it was it was not an easy one, yeah. but I look back and I wouldn't change it for anything. I do have awesome. one question: What happened to the green couch? <sighs> burned it. You burned that's, the that's green couch. That's gotta be man. now. In so the we, Hall of Fame somewhere, yeah. Man. So we, so my parents moved a couple times um, after I uh, after I graduated college, um, and that made a couple moves. But we had that green couch. Gosh, from when I was in like sixth grade to, gosh, I was like 20, so like 12 to 23, 24 years old. Mm. Uh, maybe older than that, 25, 26. Um, but yeah, I, my parents got rid of that. But like, and you I'll didn't never, see that. no, I never, I never saw what they ended up doing with it. Uh, they may have donated it or something like that, but I'll never remember it because it was a, it was like a green leather couch. And it was like when like the greens and reds and all that were like popular, right? I don't remember. But that. it was like yeah, it had scratches because there was five kids. <laughs> He's like, he just had white leather his entire life. 
<laughs> oh, what you talking about, man? I always shot the Pier 1 Import. I don't know about you. <laughs> so there were scratches yeah. on the couch? So it was like a scratch. And I remember it like there were scratches because we had five kids just climbing all uh, over yeah. it, just going crazy, mm-hmm. four boys and a girl. And so it was like, I just remember sitting there. It was, but it was like the most comfortable couch. Mm. But it, so many, that was like where I always went back to because of that right. draft day, right? I always went back to that moment and like had that feeling. So even today, if I'm having a tough time, I remember sitting, you know, uh, sitting on that green couch, looking at the TV, windows right here, sun coming in, and it's like still to this day, like the most, anytime I feel depressed, that's the vision that I mm, get is good. when it's that right there. Well, when they write your book and, and, and you know, make your movie, they're going to call it the green leather couch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's all. Awesome. All right. So let's, I know we're going to, we have to wrap yeah. up. It, it's, I mean, yeah. I, it's a phenomenal story, man. Unbelievable. But if there's one thing, mm-hmm. You just told this story about from, from start to finish and the obstacles that you had to overcome and mm-hmm. the ups and downs. If there's one thing that if you look back at your story that you wish you could change, what would that be? Wish I could change. I wish I wish that I had more faith at a young age and not necessarily like faith in, in God because because I, I grew up a Christian and I kind of walked walked that walk, but I didn't really like live it out. But I wish I just had more faith in myself. I wish I had more faith in the process and I, and ultimately in his plan because for so long, you know, I tried to act like, okay, I'm going to prove you wrong. You said I can't do it. I'm going to prove you wrong. Um, you know, my wrestling coach in high school, who I was a state champion, told me I wasn't good enough to play football, mm-hmm. that I needed to wrestle because I wasn't a good enough football player. My coach, all those guys that drove me said I couldn't do it, but I didn't really truly have faith in myself. Like deep down, the reason I was so angry is because I believed it inside mm-hmm. as well. But to have more faith that, listen, there's a plan, and if I prepare in a way that if an opportunity presents itself, then I'm ready to go. And I did, pre- I did prepare, but like, it made for a lot of dark years mm. because because I did not have faith in, in in God's plan for me, and I didn't have faith in myself. And then also, you know, faith in the relationships. And that's one thing I, I know I've said a lot is one thing that I just want people to understand is you can work as hard as you want, but there is so much that is out of out of your control. And a lot comes down to how you have treated people, how you have shown mm. people who you are as a person. All of that comes back around. So be very conscious of that as you go through life and interact with people because you never know when that person is going to be the deciding factor on a very big decision in your life. That's awesome. Right. So That's good. That's awesome. Well, we got to, you know, this, our show will continue, man. We're, we're going to yeah. be. Having these conversations, these deep conversations, I, I, I shed a tear, man. I've, Seriously, phew, that was that was that was a good story, great story, man. But uh, thank you. We're going to continue on the Darren Woodson show um, in the next couple of weeks. I know Ben will have some more. We'll probably have yeah. some guests coming up at some mm-hmm. point here, but. Mm-hmm. That's the story of Tyler Klutz. Yeah. Wow. And awesome, uh, we're Thank not done, sharing. man. Thank I appreciate sharing, you guys man. listening. I know it's a long and there's a lot going on with it, but no. appreciate you guys sitting and bearing through with this because, uh, man, I, again, as, as crazy as it may sound, like I really am so lucky. Yeah. Like I'm so lucky and they could have gone so much differently. And I'm just so glad that um, that we made it out on the other side and, and, and came around people like you guys that – you know, could mm-hmm. could make life really enjoyable. So I appreciate you guys. Thanks, awesome. brother. Thanks, yeah. brother.